Okay, we're starting a little late. We're going to go until till we're till we're not going anymore, and then uh, then we'll have Q and A after that. Uh, I was kind of thinking if we go from about six to seven, we're starting late after six, and uh, we probably will go a little after seven before we have the Q and A. But uh, I'm not short on time. I know some of you might be, and we do like to keep our word as much as possible about ending at least close to the time we say we would. Uh, but we will have a, a question and answer afterwards. It can be about whatever whatever I share here, or it can be about any other biblical subject that you may have an interest in asking questions about. Okay, we want to talk about um, what has happened to Christianity and, and church over the past 2,000 years. And I, I want to do this by making a comparison between what we know about the early church and what we can observe about modern church. And, and see in how many ways it differs, explore why those differences came about, and, um, and perhaps make something of a biblical critique that will help us to um, at least begin to find a way back if that's what you're interested in doing. I say if that's what you're interested in doing, I have to realize that some people are quite happy with church as it is, and frankly, some churches are such that there's reason to be happy with them, even though the institutional church is not, uh, in principle, very much like uh, the early church. Not everything uh, is a disaster. Uh, I think I would say most of it is, but there there are good people, pastors especially, uh, who are humble and who care for their sheep and who although the church is not set up exactly as it was in the first century, they're still ministering to people, they're feeding the sheep, and they're uh, shepherding the sheep, and, and people are growing, and that's a good thing. Uh, I, I always prefer, if I have the choice, to do things the way they were done by the apostles, by the way uh, the early church was while the apostles were still alive and leading it, because I don't consider that what's happened since then is an improvement. Um, I've talked to people who, uh, of course, uh, defend the changes that have taken place uh, to become what we now have in the institutional church, and they would say, well, this isn't corruption, this is uh, maturing. The church has matured. I mean, it was the, the apostolic church was an infant church, and, you know, a lot of things uh, have, uh, the church has expanded itself into new realms and crossed many uh, thresholds into different uh, dimensions and degrees of involvement and uh, in it within itself and so forth and and therefore it's it's matured we you know we shouldn't be critical of the fact that the modern church is not exactly like the early church now that sounds like a, a reasonable suggestion if in fact the changes did in fact represent growth uh, and maturity uh, what it appears to me is the things that Paul said made the Corinthian church carnal and babes are the things that characterize the church today uh, almost as an uncriticized uh, presupposition of what church is supposed to be. In other words, I don't think that by the church becoming more like what Paul called immature and carnal that we could call that a maturing process in the church. And whenever there is a new movement, and the church was a new movement in the days of the apostles, any, you know, people have to make decisions about how things are going to be done, how they're going to address certain issues, how they're going to solve certain problems. And the apostles, when the apostles were around doing that, uh, the church was not a perfect church, but it was set up the way they wanted it to be set up, and it did bear a lot of good fruit. And some things have changed, uh, a lot of things have changed, and the things that have changed sometime have ended up uh, causing the church to not bear at least the same kind of fruit as the apostles saw it. We have some very, very large churches which look like an advertisement for a successful move of God. And maybe some of them may be. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not here to be uh, gratuitously critical of the institutional church or, and certainly not of pastors. God knows that even the pastors in the churches that I think are the worst, most of them have their plate full. Most of them are overworked. Uh, Many of them have better motives than others do, uh, 
uh, and so I, if I make criticisms of what the church has become and, and the ways I think it's been damaged by the passing of time, uh, I'm not doing so to say that every pastor or every church would, uh, in, to the same degree, deserve this kind of analysis. But frankly, even the best churches I've been to, generally speaking, most of them, still reflect all the things that characterize institutional church and which I think are not an improvement over the way things were done by the apostles. Now Jesus appointed the apostles to be his, as it were, his replacement on earth, uh, you know, setting things up and promoting the kingdom of God. And I think they did a bang up job, frankly. In less than 30 years, a movement that started in Jerusalem had reached the entire Roman Empire, uh, largely due to martyrdom of its founders, but uh, they uh, and they, they, they did it, and they, and they had something really good that has stood the test of time. Even though it's got undergone modifications that I might be critical of, it is still here, and there's still genuine Christians, uh, and, and there's still a true church. I'm, I'm favorable to the church. I want to make that very clear. I, I believe the church is the body of Christ. I believe the church is the bride of Christ. I believe the church is the community of, and the colony of the kingdom of God on earth. Those are all very good things. But I don't equate the word church with what I would call the institutional church. I believe that true church is made up of all people who are truly born again, truly surrendered to Christ, truly acknowledge him as Lord and have made every effort for that to be reflected in their, their lives, uh, that they want to obey Christ. That, I think everyone like that is a disciple of Jesus. And all the disciples in the world combined, collectively, are the church, the body of Christ. Now, of course, when you go to any institutional church, there are some of those people there. I'm, I'm not sure if I've ever been in any institutional church that didn't have some real Christians there. I, I believe that real Christians have infiltrated every institution, including, <laughs> including the institutional churches. But uh, at the same time, I've never been to an institutional church where I could be very confident that most of the people there were really disciples who have made such a commitment to Christ as I think the real church is characterized by. So let's talk about the church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, as we all know, uh, Peter, you are uh, the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now Roman Catholics have thought that means that Peter is somehow the head of the church. Now it makes it sound like he's the bottom of the church. If the church is built on top of him, he's not on top of it. Of course, Jesus said to all of his apostles, whoever would be chief among you must be the slave of all, which means that the way up in importance in the church is really the way down to becoming the least and the most servant-minded of, of the church. Uh, Peter and the apostles did comprise the foundation of the church. It says that in Ephesians chapter 2. It says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Um, Peter, in 1 Peter, that was Ephesians 2, but in Peter, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 5, he said that we are like living stones built up into a spiritual house, uh, you know, a holy temple and a holy priesthood. So the church, that, that is the people of God, the true people who follow Christ, are like stones that are assembled by God uh, into a growing temple that's a habitation of God through the Spirit, Paul said. And that is a global phenomenon. Now, like stones being built into a spiritual house, there's got to be some form of assembly. You don't just take a bunch of stones and call that a, a house. You, they have to be assembled in some way. There have to be relationships between them. There have to be, there must be some kind of blueprint which defines how these stones relate to each other in their placement in the walls and so forth. And that blueprint, I think, is, is Scripture, and we find that <coughs> in Scripture, every member, every living stone in the true church has a role to play and has divinely bestowed gifts that enable them to do those things through the power of the Spirit of God. Now, many of the things that people in New Testament times did through the power of the Spirit can be learned without even possessing the Spirit. Uh, it is pot I mean, not everything can be, like raising the dead and things like that. You can't learn that going to college. But you can learn how to organize a group of people by going to college. 
you can learn to run a business, uh, which most churches are run like businesses, frankly, now, even if they're, even, even churches that are more or less pretty good churches, they, they're, they're corporations. They're 501c3 corporations, which I, I happen to know because the Narrow Path is also a 501c3 corporation. And uh, that means it's a corporation. The Narrow Path is not a body. The Narrow Path is a radio program. And, uh, but the church is, is a body. And when Christians gather together for church, it should not be like a corporation. It should be like a body like, or like a family. And so, so it's really hard to do church the way we read about it in the New Testament while those structures are in place. And while I'm always an advocate for doing things the way the apostles did them, I realize that there's a, some people here and certainly many pastors, don't know if we have any pastors here, that find themselves unable to find a congregation that does things the way the apostles did it, and they're making the best of an imperfect situation. And they're doing pretty good. They can still be bearing fruit. They can still be winning souls. They can still be making disciples, even if they're not doing it the way the apostles did. But if they're not doing it the way the apostles did, we have to ask who decided to change that and why? And what has been the result? Has it been an improvement over what the apostles did? Or has something been lost by human beings coming up with uh, new traditions about things? That's certainly a question worth asking. And after I talk about this, if you say, well, I still, you know, I, I like my church. I have good friends, good relationships. I like the pastor's preaching. It's all good. You know, we're, we're, we're growing. I'm not going to try to talk you out of it. But I do think Christians should be aware of the ways in which the churches you're likely to encounter in modern times, what they lack in terms of what the New Testament church possessed under the leadership of the apostles. That's, that's my motive for talking about this. Um, let's talk about what we do know about the primitive assemblies of the early church. And uh, we can look at Acts chapter 2 and, and the other early chapters of Acts to see really how they did things. Now we could say, but they did things not, very, they weren't very thought out. They were kind of spontaneous. They were going kind to of surprise by 3,000 converts in one day, and suddenly there was a church to manage, and they just, they just did it as they knew to do it, but you know, now that we've had more time to look at it and analyze, we think, oh, there's more efficient ways to do it. I'm not one of those who says that. Um, I think the apostles were led by the Holy Spirit probably more than any other church leaders in any time in history. And uh, even though they did have to kind of scramble sometimes, I mean, for example, some of the systems they had set up, they had to modify, like when the Gentile widows were being neglected and they had to assign some guys to look into that. But we can see, in general, what they thought of as normative, right from the very beginning, in terms of the Christian community. And so I want to answer, ask and answer certain questions. Here's the questions I want to ask. And when we answer these questions, we can ask, how do modern churches do this? I'm not going to answer that right now. We'll come to that later on. First question, how did they gather? How often, that is. How often did they get together? We know how often people get together now, usually once a week. And sometimes there's big disputes over whether you're supposed to do it on Sunday or Saturday uh, among certain types of people, as if a weekly gathering was somehow dictated in the New Testament, and as if they met on week, uh, a weekly basis. But how often did they gather? Uh, where did they gather? We know where churches usually gather now, at big buildings that have uh, big mortgages, uh, or sometimes they manage to pay them off as they go, and they don't have a mortgage, but they still have a big uh, structure to maintain. And, uh, and sometimes maybe that's done out of necessity. We'll, we'll explore that. But how often did they gather? Where did they gather? What did they do in their meetings? Anyone who's been raised in the church like me knows pretty much the, the drill uh, for a Sunday morning service. You've got an opening prayer. You've got some singing. You've got announcements, maybe a little more singing. Uh, you've got uh, maybe the choir will sing. And then, then we've got a sermon and in the kind of churches I was raised in, an altar call and then uh, a closing prayer or benediction. That's uh, virtually, I mean, I've been in churches, all kinds of churches. Of course, I haven't been in the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. I, they do things a bit different, I know. But frankly, the Protestant churches I've been in, of many stripes, they all do things kind of the same way. And, okay, so what did they do in the Bible times at their churches? How were their finances done? When you don't have a corporation... How do you handle corporate finances? 
I mean, think about it. If you don't have a 501c3 or some other kind of corporate entity, how does a group of people own a building? Who owns it? Well, if it's owned by a private party, great. If the, if a, where I'm speaking tomorrow in Albany, the church, it's a church building, but it's owned by some private guys who bought the building. And, uh, and it's not really run like a regular church, I don't think. I don't know what it does when I'm not here, but, uh, but it's owned by some individuals, not a corporation. <clears throat> but when you've got you know, hundreds of people coming to a big building, it's not very often the case that that building is held uh, by a, a private owner who's just volunteering to let the, the gathering be there. Usually there's a corporation so that no one person is responsible for everything and they run it like, a, like, a, like any corporation runs a, a building that they own. That's not what they did in the early church. Where did they meet? How did they do their finances? <clears throat> uh, how was the church growth accomplished and what were the results of their practices? Uh, and how do they compare with ours? Well, those are the questions I want to ask. So let's first of all <clears throat> ask, uh, how often did they gather? Well, we have some direct statements about that. Again, uh, our friends uh, in the Seventh-day Adventist movement would say, well, we're commanded to meet on Saturday, the Sabbath. And most churches will say, well, no, the Sabbath is Sunday now, which is, of course, not a biblical statement. But uh, they say, but therefore, the church meets on Sunday. And, and so the debate is, what day of the week is the church supposed to get together? Well, what day of the week did the early church get together? Well, that's pretty easy to answer. If you go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 46, it says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Now, when it says they ate their food with gladness, it doesn't mean, you know, all of them who were eating the same meals they were eating before they were Christians, now they're just happier while they're eating their dinners. No, they're talking about eating together. And we'll say more about that when we talk about what they did when they got together. Yeah. Um, and and for, I, I've been in many institutional churches that they do eat together. That after every Sunday service, they, they actually have a big potluck. And I think it's a really good thing. I think, I think eating is a big part of Christian gatherings in the New Testament. In fact, they had what they called the Agape Feast, which was at least once a week. It might have been every time they got together, which is, I mean, in some cases, they got together daily. I know during the Jesus Movement, which is a revival that took place when I was a teenager, um, we went to church every day, every night. We wanted to hear the Bible taught every night of the week. And then during the day, we wanted to get together with each other and talk about the Bible some more, talk about the things of God and tell other people about Jesus. I mean, it was a daily church. Um, it, it's like there wasn't anything, there wasn't any reprieve from the influence of the Word of God uh, being reinforced through teaching and stuff every day. That sounds like maybe what they did back then. Of course, that happens during revivals. During revivals, and, and they certainly had one in the Book of Acts, and the one I was fortunate to see in, in, in the Jesus Movement, had these encounters. When people have, are revived, they're excited. They're hungry for the Word of God. They want to be with other Christians. They want to worship together. It's, it's like a thrill. And when the revival dies down, it's not so much a thrill. It becomes sort of an obligation. And then the question is, how often do we have to meet? Not how often do we get to meet. How often are we required to meet? Oh, can we get away with it on Sundays only? Maybe Sunday and Wednesday? You know, maybe. <coughs> well, <coughs> during a revival, that's not the way people think about it. Now, we might say we can't blame us that we don't have a revival. I'd love to have one. Uh, we just don't have one. I even pray for it. They don't have so. Don't blame me that we don't have a revival. But on the other hand, maybe if we did things the way they did, it would create an environment where revival was more common. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm realistic. We went to church every night of the week in the Jesus movement because we were all unmarried young people who didn't have jobs. Right? <clears throat> Bunch of hippies. And, uh, and, and I got married younger than most of my friends. I got married when I was 19 and had a kid by the time I was 21. And, um, and, but I was a teacher, so I still went to, I was still teaching nine times a week places. But um, people who aren't teachers are, are not obligated to be those things. They have wife and kids and jobs. One thing I didn't have was a job. And, uh, you know, people, let, let's face it, they're too tired to go to church every night, maybe. But that's a shame because I don't find, I, I don't understand what too tired to go to church means. Not because I'm so spiritual, but because going to, to be with the people of God 
is invigorating for me. I love it. And of course, that might be partly because I have such an opportunity to share when I'm there. I'm usually, I'm, I'm not always, but usually the one teaching. And, you know, I, I go on teaching itineraries. People say, don't you ever get tired teaching? No, I get, I get energized teaching. Uh, but I also get energized listening to good teaching. I mean, I, I, I'm energized to learn things. Uh, but I, I guess I'm just trying to give a slight pass to the modern churches that don't meet every night. Let's face it, the majority of the congregation have other things obligations to families, jobs, and things like that. But at least we know this. The early church wanted to get together every day. They weren't forced to. And even if we can't do it, we should have such a walk with God that we just, and, and such a hunger for fellowship with true people who are like-minded that we wish we could do it every night or every day. Anyway, I don't think they had the concept in the early church of a weekly meeting. What day of the week do we have to go to church? Uh, no, it's like they were meeting daily. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 42, it says, uh, there isn't a verse 42, what do I have here? Five, uh, oh, I'm looking for one chapter, okay, there is one. Uh, 542, it says, and daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So daily, again, the early church was doing these things daily. Now, um, I kind of gave away from that, uh, about that sort of uh, where they gathered. Because the same verses that tell us how often they gathered also tells us where. Both of those verses we look at said they gathered daily in the temple and from house to house. And it also says, and they ate their bread with gladness. So they were eating with each other house to house too. This is where churches often met. We can see this not just in the early Jerusalem church. We see it in the churches that Paul wrote to. He, he writes uh, to the Ro Roman church and says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the church that meets in their house. In fact, in uh, Romans chapter 16, although he doesn't say their house that many times, there seem to be five groups of people who are probably households that were fellowship groups in Rome. Uh, and we know that you know one of them was in the home of Priscilla and Aquila. Philemon lived in Colossae, and there's reference to the church in his house. And uh, so you find in, in various places the church in people's house. Lydia in Philippi had the church in her house. Uh, it's so nice to have church in a home because it doesn't cost the church anything extra. And there's no question about needing a corporation to own the building. Somebody in the church already owns the building, or at least rents it, and uh, they, they, they become the host of a group of Christians, so there doesn't need to be any uh, corporation to own it. And that, by the way, that solves a lot of other problems we'll talk about later on that we have in our modern church. That meeting in homes is, uh, it's not mandatory. They also met in the temple, which in, in Jerusalem, the temple had public gathering areas that anyone's meeting. So uh, Paul, when he was in Corinth, he met in a, the school of Tyrannus. Uh, uh, yeah, I believe it was in Corinth. It could have been in Ephesus. But uh, he, he first started meeting in synagogues, Jewish synagogues, and then when they kicked him out of those, uh, he, he apparently rented or was able to secure the use of a school building and use it. So, I mean, obviously they didn't always meet in, in uh, homes, but they didn't have buildings of their own, it would appear. We, that is to say, church buildings dedicated to their meetings. They did eventually, you know, in the second and third century they did, but the original church didn't see any need for them. And, you know, I said, well, we couldn't put... You know, the people of our church, we couldn't fit them in homes. Not in one home, perhaps. I don't think they fit the 3,000 people who were converted on the day of Pentecost in one house either. They met in multiple homes. But these homes were not denominationally different from each other. They were all part of the big local family. They just had meetings from house to house. They met in homes, but maybe not always the same home for the same people. They, it was like all the Christians in town were the family. And they got together in smaller groups. Uh, in order to accommodate them, and usually usually in homes, but sometimes in the larger meetings too. I would suspect that the, when they met in the temple, that was the large, probably all, of, all the local Christians in Jerusalem got together for these larger meetings in the larger venues, but then they would, uh, church would largely be held in homes. And, uh, you know, I saw, there was a revival, Jesus People Movement in Australia I visited and taught back in the early 80s, and uh, they had about well, the first time I went there, they had about 300 people. The second time, I, a year later, they had about 500. 
they were a bunch of hippies who were all converted. And, um, and they had 50 community houses. That, I mean, these, these 500 people lived in 50 community houses. And <clears throat> they had meetings every night in these houses, except about once a week they had one big meeting, and they'd, they'd rent an auditorium or something for that, a, a public access facility, so that they'd still remember they're all one body in that town, uh, <clears throat> though most of their meetings were in smaller groups. That's very probably how they did it in the big, big cities in the New Testament. We do read them meeting daily in the temple and in the homes. And, that, and that's probably very similar to what they did in Australia when I was there. Uh, what did they do? Well, we have a statement of what they did when they gathered, what they do at their church meetings. In Acts chapter 2, now remember these weren't Sunday meetings, these were daily meetings, but uh, Acts 2 and verse 42 it says, uh, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that is, the apostles' teaching, <coughs> and um, in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, that's eating, and in prayers. Now, some might say, well, breaking of bread, that's talking about, about taking communion. Well, that could well be. That could well be. But from what the early fathers of the church say, and even what the apostles wrote, uh, when they took communion, it was at a meal. It was part of a meal. We know that because Paul said in Corinth when they took communion, they're really messing it up because some people were taking too much food and some were taking too much wine so that some people were going home hungry. Apparently that's not supposed to happen when you take communion. It must be a meal if people are expected to go home with their bellies full. And some are going away drunk, which means they weren't drinking a thimble full of uh, grape juice. <laughs> they, their communion was a meal. <clears throat> okay, so we'll talk more about that. Uh, and that's what they did here. What they, they continued the apostles' teaching. Now, we don't have the apostles here. Some people say there are apostles today, but I can't find any. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not against there being apostles today. I just can't find any. I've been teaching 50 years, and that whole time I've been in roughly, or, or seriously, charismatic circles. Youth with a Mission, I've been teaching for, for 30-something years around the world, every, every uh, continent, multiple times. And they're very charismatic more than I am, but um, nonetheless, I've never met a real apostle in one of those groups, and I'm thinking if there are apostles today, where would you find them? If I can teach for 50 years around the whole world in one of the most charismatic missionary societies around, the ones who actually believe that there are apostles and prophets, and I can't meet anyone that really qualifies. I mean, every church would be in trouble if they had to have an apostle there, but every church that has a Bible has the apostles' doctrine. And therefore, if you have somebody in the church who can teach the biblical doctrines the apostles wrote, or that Jesus, what Jesus said, which of course was reported by the apostles too, then you've got something like what they had. Not quite the same, because if someone understood what Paul said, if someone misunderstood what Paul said in those days, they could ask him. <laughs> if Peter said something controversial uh, or, or just unclear, they could ask him because he was there. That's a problem we don't have, a benefit we don't have now, it's a problem we have, is that we have the apostles teaching, but we don't have them here to clarify it. Well, what do we have? We have the Holy Spirit, but that, that's, that doesn't solve the problem entirely, because everybody who's got a different opinion says they have the Holy Spirit to teach them. So, uh, frankly, what we have to do a little more than what they had to do is do some exegesis. We have to look at what Paul said, say... Some people think he meant that. Some people think he meant that. Let's really study this very responsibly, very objectively, without an agenda, and see if the context and the words he used can, can be, we can really get to the bottom of what Paul really was saying. That's, I think, our responsibility, because we, we need the apostles' teaching, too. Um, and then they, for fellowship, of course, it's not really clear what fellowship means in this context. It's, of course, the word koinonia, but the word koinonia like the word koine, Greek, koine means common. Koinonia means sharing in common. So it's not clear whether they're sharing money in common or sharing food in common or what. I'm probably sharing much of, most of everything in common. Uh, I, I suspect from reading 1 Corinthians and Paul's discussion about the gifts, what they were sharing is their gifts. You know, someone has a gift of prophecy, they give a prophecy, they share it with the church. 
someone has a gift of teaching, they share it with the church. They, you know, they share together in the common resources that God had given the church through the various gifts and so forth. But also material things, we find. So they fellowship, or they had common life, is probably the best way to understand fellowship in this. And then in prayers, group prayer. Now, we all pray. But unless you're in a very unusual church, group prayer does not comprise a very large portion of the meetings. There's prayer. The pastor will pray at the beginning, he'll pray at the end, and you might even, you know, have a situation where there's some time so let's all pray together, uh, or any prayer request. But usually, it's not a major part of most church services. Now, I could, I, I could be wrong. I've been to one home church where they take about half their meeting with prayer, uh, which is a, a healthy thing. Um, I think the one reason our country is in the shape it's in is because the church, which is fairly... Uh, has fairly high representation in this country as Christians. Pretty pretty big percentage of evangelical Christians in this country, more than anywhere in Europe, for example. Uh, I think it's that we haven't prayed effectively or enough. And I think it's because we're, we're very individualistic. I mean, if you get up and pray two hours or one hour every morning, I doubt that most of you do. I have to say I don't. I sometimes resolve to. I many times resolve to, and I get up, and uh, you know, after a half hour or maybe even less, sometimes I thought, well, I don't remember anything, and my mind's wondering what I got to do today and stuff. I have, I'm just confessing my own carnality here. I just, uh, I believe in prayer. I really do believe in prayer, and I believe it's the most powerful thing God has given us. And uh, and yet the devil opposes our prayer lives a great deal. Uh, I do find when I'm praying with other people, it's easier to stay focused. And if, that, if praying with other people went an hour long, as long as, you know, there's not a whole bunch of boring prayers, like, you know, uh, my, my cousin's best friend's wife stubbed her toe, and Lord, please bless them and make them feel better. I mean, if there's a lot of that kind of stuff, I have to say my mind wanders to things more interesting. But honestly, uh, there's some very important things that need prayer, and you have not because you ask not. It's interesting that the Lord's Prayer that we have, we pray it individually, and some churches sometimes pray it from the pulpit and stuff too, but every, every pronoun in that, every personal pronoun is plural. Give, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. It's a collective prayer for the church of God. And uh, I mean, we, we pray it for ourselves and for our family and so forth, but this Making prayer one of the main things that Christians do when they get together, collective prayer, focused prayer, I think is uh, something we're reading about them doing. In fact, when Peter was put in prison and he got sprung by the angel to get out of prison, where did he go? He went to Mary John Mark's mother's house where there was a prayer meeting going on. And they were all praying late in the night, in the middle of the night they're praying. And they probably had started early. You know, I think prayer played a much bigger role in the early church meetings than it probably does in most of the churches we're familiar with. Um, and then, of course, there was, um, let's see, doctrine, fellowship, uh, breaking of bread, and prayers. Yeah, the breaking of bread. I, most people would probably say, well, that's taking communion. Um, some would say the Eucharist. Uh, it could be. But as I said, in those days, they took communion over a meal together. So they were actually in a table fellowship kind of situation. I wouldn't be surprised if some of those meetings were just held at the meal table, you know? Uh, I don't know that that's the case. They might have had some place where they sat. That what we do at our home church, and I'm not saying everyone should do it that way, but just our way of trying to make all these things happen there, is uh, we have a time of uh, singing, of course. We still follow kind of a major, uh, a typical pattern of the Protestant churches. Uh, we have a time of worship. It usually goes as much as an hour. And then uh, we have a time of prayer that might go a half hour together. So people share requests and we pray. And then we take a break. We go in the kitchen and uh, we eat. Of course, people show up a half hour early for me and they eat that half hour too. This is a, an eating meeting. Uh, this is People come a half hour early to eat. We do the singing, the praying, take a break for more eating. Then we come back to another room where we have a table where we uh, have a Bible study. And then uh, when we close, we eat some more. And uh, yes. the meeting usually ends around one, and people are done eating around four, usually. So, 
And some of them are fat, as you might guess. But the truth is that that's not mandatory. You don't have to eat so much as you get fat. But, uh, you know, eating this, there's just something about eating with people. kind of gets you talking and gets you, you know, casual with each other in a good way. So anyway, that's, that, those are the things they did. And I'm not saying that the way our home church does it is the way it should be done, because I'm not sure they did it the way we do it. But we try to at least include the same things that they thought were important to do when they got together. Um, okay, they gathered, as I said, uh, mostly in homes, uh, sometimes public buildings in addition to homes. Um, they did those four things, it says. And uh, how did they handle their finances? Well, Initially, they didn't even have deacons to do that. I think a modern Protestant churches often have a board of deacons that manage, hopefully manages the finances well. Um, but the assumption in the early church was that when you become a disciple, you forsake all that you have. That doesn't mean you sell your house and give away your car, but it means that everything you have becomes God's. It becomes Christ's. Just like when the apostles, uh, you know, they forsook all to follow Jesus. When the rich young ruler refused to do so, Peter said, well, what shall we have? We, we've forsaken everything. And Jesus said, well, you'll have you know, such and such, uh, you know, hundredfold blessing and so forth afterwards. But, but the point is that Peter was recognized as one who had forsaken everything. That's what you had to do. Jesus said, unless you forsake all that you have, you can't be my disciple. But Peter lived in a house that he apparently owned. He, had, he, went, he had still had fishing tackle, he had his boat, his nets, all the stuff he had in a sense before he was a Christian. He had a wife and children. He didn't forsake them in the physical sense of walking away from them, but he had to forsake them to be a disciple, which means he must have reassigned their ownership in a sense to God or to Christ. I have a house, but it's really Christ's house. If he wants someone to, if he wants me to show hospitality to somebody, uh, it's, that's his choice, not mine. You know, same thing, my, my car, anything I have. Uh, it's his. Now, I have to be a steward of it. That means that if somebody who's a reckless driver, or someone who I don't know if he has driver's license, wants to borrow my car, I have to really think twice before I say yes about that. Because that might not be a good stewardship of, of the car. Or, or it might be in certain circumstances. I don't know. But, I mean, we really have to use wisdom and stewardship. But the idea is that when we became disciples, we changed over the title of everything we had to Christ. And, and that means to God. So that the Bible says if any of them were poor, well, he said there weren't any poor. There weren't any poor among them. But there had, well, who, some who had been poor before they came to the church. But it says no one said that the things he possessed was his own. But as any had need, those who possessed lands and houses and so forth were selling them, it says. Now, most translations don't say were selling them. It just said they sold them. And you could get the impression that this was kind of what happened when you join the church, you sell everything, hand over to the apostles, let them distribute it like a big communist system. And I don't think that's how we're to understand I think later on in the book of Acts, we still see that Mark's mother owned a house. We find that Philemon owned a house. We know that Priscilla and Aquila owned a house. So it's not like they had to you know, just dump everything in the lap of the apostles. Now I can be a Christian because I've dumped everything. It, it's rather that nothing they had could be held on to as if it was their own. They had to treat everything they had as if it really belonged to Christ and therefore was available to the least of them. Uh, and and it, they didn't have a communal system such as you know communism would be. A lot of Christians who favor socialism or communism some say, well, isn't that how the early church did things? Well, they did this because they had one heart, it says. Uh, the whole community was of one heart and one soul. And they didn't consider that the things they had were theirs. You see, there's a, a communal heart. But there was individual stewardship of possessions. And it was something they were doing, it says. It says, as any had need, which is probably occasionally, those who had extra were selling them and giving them money over. So it wasn't that there was... In, in the early church, they didn't pay it. They didn't tithe. At least we have no record of tithing in the early church. Tithing means where you take 10% of your income and give it to the priests uh, or to the temple. Well, there is no temple. There's no physical temple or priests, no special priesthood in the body of Christ. 
And therefore, the temple is the whole body. And as there's needs in the body of Christ, uh, in as much as you do it to the least of his brethren, you do it to him. You, the way you give to God is by giving to his people in need. Uh, and that's what Jesus said to the rich young ruler. He said, sell what you have and give it to the poor. He didn't say give it to me or give it to my disciples. He said, sell what you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasures in heaven. He said the same thing in Luke when he said to the disciples themselves. He said, sell what you have and give alms and provide for yourself bags that do not become old, a treasure in the heavens. So where do you make your, when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, don't lay up treasures on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven, where do you make that deposit? Uh, well, helping the poor. And I want to say something about that because it's, it, 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 some people get overzealous and they just say, I guess, I guess I better sell everything and give it to, you know, the guy at the bottom of the off ramp. Um, that is not good stewardship. It's really difficult to give to the poor in this country and know that you're really giving to someone who has any real need that can't be easily supplied by them getting a job or getting, you know, just going to a homeless shelter. I mean, there's so many ways that people who are poor in this country can get by without the church's money, which should be concerned about real poor people. Remember how Paul told Timothy, you know, anyone who has widows, widowed mothers, you take care of them so that the church doesn't have to be burdened with theirs. You know, those who are widows indeed and don't have anyone to take care of them, then the church should take care of it. But the church shouldn't be taking care of needs that there's an easy, other, obvious, responsible someone to, to take care of them. And it's very hard to find people in this country who are really poor and can't find some other way of getting out of their poverty. But there are some. There certainly are disabled people with no families or poor families. There are people who work hard but just don't make enough wages. They got a lot of kids. They got, you know, problems. Uh, maybe they have a health crisis, and you know, there's all kinds of ways people can have legitimate needs, which even though they're hardworking and godly, they they don't have the money on hand for it. And that's how God provides for His people through other of His people. And of course, there's always a lot of real legitimately poor people in other countries. And uh, I have to say that. When I give money, I, most of it I give to ministries that are helping the poor in Haiti or some other, you know, third world country where, you know, there's really horrible poverty and there's no solution except for the gifts of generous people. Though there's a, a portion that I give to people I know of here who have genuine needs, working poor or whatever, or disabled. Everyone has to make their own decision about that. But we can see that the needs of the people were not met by government programs in the early church. They might have been met by relatives, and probably that would be the first line of support to be sought. But where, where there were widows that didn't have support, uh, we see that if, for Acts chapter 6, verse 1, that they distributed uh, the goods of the church. They didn't have to pay for any buildings. That leaves a lot of money to help people who are having trouble with their put food on the table. Uh, and they also, in my opinion, did not have salaries, salaried staff. Now, some people will argue with me about that. In fact, I had a friend here in Oregon when I lived here who used to write very upset letters to me because he was a paid salaried minister in, in the area. And from time to time, I, I, I don't say it all the time, but when people ask, I would say on the, earth, uh, on the air, I don't believe in salaried clergy. Uh, I don't think the early church had salaried clergy. They had supported clergy. Now, that salaried and supported are different. I gladly support missionaries. I gladly support a, a Bible teacher or a pastor that, that is, you know, serving God and living off by faith. I mean, that's not... I mean, I live by faith. I don't say that because I need the money. Actually, I'm not, I'm not doing too bad, so I'm not trying to, you know, say anything about me except what my policy has always been. I don't, I went in the ministry 50 years ago and I decided I would never charge. For, I'd, never get, I'd never take a salary, I'd never work for any Christian organization that, except as a volunteer. And, um, and I wouldn't charge for materials because Jesus said freely you receive, freely give. So I don't, I don't believe. I, it, would, it would hurt my conscience to ever be on salary. It doesn't hurt my conscience to receive gifts as I often do in the mail and, and, and stuff on my work. Where I speak, sometimes there's gifts, but 
Uh, I mean, I do live off of that. I don't have any guaranteed income in my life, and I, and I haven't for 50 years. But, uh, and I'm not complaining, because I'm, God's taking very good care of me. Uh, but I, salaried staff, I don't know how to justify it, because a salary is different than support. If I feel led to help somebody that I, is in need, a, a minister who would be in need if he wasn't supported, I just, I'm glad to give it to him. I, I mean, I, I know that ministers are doing real work, because I do real work. I mean, it's not, not work that I charge for, but it's work. And, and I appreciate that about people. But it's one thing to be supported by God, because he's your master and you're his servant, on the one hand, or being supported by a corporation, because you're its servant. And it's your boss. And therefore, you have to keep the boss happy if you want the paychecks to keep coming. You see, I just, I, I don't want to criticize pastors who do it differently than me. I really don't. But I don't think the apostles charged the salary. I don't think there's anyone in the early church who uh, every Friday the apostles went to the, you know, uh, window and got their paycheck for the, for the week. I don't think Jesus did either. I'm not sure who would have given him his check. We do read that there were women that supported Jesus and the apostles. But I'm pretty sure he didn't have a contract labor arrangement with them. Okay, I'll, I'll heal this many people, you give me this much money. Uh, Jesus didn't attach any price to his service, neither, neither did the apostles. Uh, they were supported. But it's a world of difference to say, I'm serving God and God will provide. And he'll probably provide through people. That's how it usually happens. He's not going to make money, you know, appear on my lawn in the morning like manna. But... It's a big difference between that and saying, I'll work for this organization. I'll minister in the Word of God. I'll do, I'll serve the people, but I expect every Friday this much money for it. That's being a contract laborer to me. Maybe uh, pastors who do that may not, they may have another way of understanding that. The Bible does say the laborer is worthy of his hire. Paul said, if I've ministered to you in spiritual things, it's no big thing for me to be ministered back in material things. I understand that. And those, those are the things the ministers always bring up when they don't like what I say about this. They also say it's not practical. They, they say, well, you're on the radio. That's why you can support. I was in the ministry for 25 years before I was ever on the radio. And I was an unknown guy. But I still trusted God and he provided for me. I had to live in poverty a lot of the time. That's okay. Jesus, uh, Paul said, having food and clothing, we shall with these things be content. So if a minister who's super, serving God, as Paul did, or any other, I think has to be prepared to live uh, on whatever God provides and uh, not make demands that it's, you know, that they get so much back. Um, that's me. I, I, I tell this story in one of my recent books, my second book on the empire of the risen sun. But there's a, a pastor in our town, a pastor of a very large church, and when I moved to town I met with him in, in his office and he was talking with me just to become acquainted with him. And uh, he told me that his church had had a split a few years earlier, and they'd lost so many people and so much money that they had to fire a significant part of their large staff. And I asked him if he would think me rude to tell him what I would have done in his situation, and he welcomed it. I don't know if he was glad that he did, but he... He was polite enough to welcome it. I said, well, what I would have done... If I was in your position, here's what I would have done. I would have called all the staff in and told them, you know, we've lost a significant portion of our congregation and therefore a significant part of our income. We can't support this staff anymore. We, we do not have the money for your salaries. I can do one of two things. I can either fire enough of you that I can keep paying those who we retain, or if you feel like God's called you to be here, and if he hasn't, you shouldn't be here anyway, but if you feel like God's called you to be here, We'll let you continue your ministry. We're not going to pull the rug out from under your ministry. But we won't pay you anything. And I myself won't take any pay either. We, we will have no paid staff. All the way down to the secretaries and the janitors. There is a ministry, a gift of helps. That is just, the same kind of, it's just as important as a gift of preaching. Everyone who serves God should serve for free. And if they can't, you know, if they, if they think, well, where am I getting my money? Well, if you're serving God, they should come. Answer should be easy. The laborer is worthy of his hire. 
if you're laboring for God, God knows how to get the money into your hands that you need. And I said, if you called your staff here and said, listen, none of you are going to be paid. I'm not going to be paid from now on. We're going to trust God. We'll let the congregation know that there's been a change. None of you guys are getting salaries. They're living on faith. And we'll just see which of you God supports. That's how you will know if God has called you to be here or not. And if he hasn't, it's certainly much better for you to go somewhere else where he will support you because because he'll be on your he'll want you there you know if God wants you doing what you're doing he'll supply the needs now that doesn't mean everybody should just quit their job and say you know God supply for me no most people are supplied their needs by their jobs because they're doing work that you cannot uh, that, that you can in good conscience you can accept a paycheck for but when you're not supposed to charge for the Word of God a minister who ministers the Word of God should not charge for it and hey, I'm not working for this organization or that, or that church or that thing. Uh, I'm working for God. He knows what my needs are. And uh, I got that idea, of course, from George Mueller and others that I read about when I was young. I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. That way you always know if God's really supporting your ministry or not, meaning he approves of it. If he doesn't supply for you your needs, then he doesn't approve of your ministry. And you better find what he does approve of. Because... I've lived that way for 50 years, and I have to just say, yeah, you have to be poor sometimes, like Paul said. Sometimes having food and clothing, you've got to be content with that. But um, what's wrong with that? I've never seen why that would be a bad thing. You know, being content is the secret of happiness. Some people might say, well, you know, I, I wouldn't be happy with the, only that much. Well, then, shame on you. It says in Hebrews, be content with such things as you have. And let your life be free of covetousness. So, I mean, the money thing is always a problem in the church if, if uh, people are doing it for the money. Now, I know there's some paid pastors who aren't doing it for the money. They'd be a pastor even if there was no money in But the church happens to, that's, you know, that's their policy. They give a paycheck to the pastor. Uh, but I think even they would be happier. I'm not saying they're doing the wrong thing. I, I think they'd be even happier if they just said, listen, don't give me a paycheck. Just put a box in the back and let God provide for me. If I'm serving him, he knows. If I'm serving, if I do what he wants, he knows my needs. Uh, because frankly, we, we all know about scandals that have happened to ministers who were on salary and they kept on salary and kept doing these bad things for years before they were discovered. Just think if they'd been trusting God for their finances, he would have taken them out earlier. I, I, frankly, I really think this was the early church's pattern. You know, at the end of the first century, there's a book called the Didache, which describes the church practices uh, in the generation after the apostles. And it actually uh, tells many ways to know if a person is a false prophet. One of them is, if he asks for money, he's a false prophet. They must have assumed that you don't have to ask for money if you're a true prophet. If you're truly serving God, God must know what your needs are. A lot of people don't really believe enough in their own ministry to do that. And uh, or, or they're not convinced enough that God cares about their ministry enough to support it. But I can tell you, I'm not, this is not idealistic stuff for me. This is where the rubber meets the road for me. That's how I've lived for 50 years and many other before me, including, I think, Jesus and the apostles. You know, and I'm not them, but I think they set the pattern for um, ministry as servanthood as opposed to ministry as a job. And again, I, I realize whenever I say that any ministers who are paid a salary, they feel like I'm condemning them. No, I'm not. I don't judge another man's servant. That's between them and God. I'm just saying that's the way I'm pretty sure Jesus lived. I'm pretty sure the apostles did. That's the way a lot of my heroes have lived and the way I've lived. So it works. I know it works. I know there is a God. I know a lot of Christians sometimes have their doubts. Honestly, they would never say they doubt it. But if it comes down to, I don't know where the money's coming from. I just lost my job. You know, uh, just, got, uh, you know just got a health uh, crisis. How are we going to pay for this? Well, there's a God, isn't there? If there's a God, why are you worried about that? I, 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 I want to tell you, I'm not a man of great faith. I have chosen this way of living because I think it requires me to trust God when I am not naturally inclined to do it. There have been many times 
I've been worried about my finances because they were pretty sparse at many times. And God would provide just at the right moment, the right amount, and so forth. But even so, I, another time would come, I, it's like the children of Israel in the wilderness. You know, God provides, they should never have another doubt. But you do. You, you have your doubts. That's my weakness. And I remember times when I just say, God, I've got rent money coming up. There's, I don't have any money in the bank. don't have anything. I have kids to support. And I'd, I'd be praying like that, and, and, a, and a voice would speak to me. I suppose it was God's saying, well, do you have a father or don't you? Well, that's really all you have to ask yourself and answer. If you answer rightly, there's nothing to worry about. Um, did you ever hear that old poem? I first heard it when I was in junior high. I, I really like it. It's very simple based on Jesus' teachings about this. He said, the poem goes, Said the robin to the sparrow, I'd truly like to know why these anxious human beings rush around and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, think, I think it must be, friend, that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Um, I mean, if, if animals could think and know that, you know, they just count on God, they can't figure out why we don't. Don't we have a father too? Now, I say this mainly to challenge ministers because I think the early church ministers didn't take a salary, but I think they were supported. They just didn't know how much would come in. It's, it, it might make some people feel uncomfortable, but I have to say it's not uncomfortable. Well, it is. It is sometimes it is. But as long as you be content with whatever God provides, and it'll always be enough as long as he wants you to survive. By the way, the, the, birds trust God, but sometimes they starve. But not one falls to the ground apart from the will of your father. Some people starve too, but not apart from the will of your father. All I want is God's will. If all you want is God's will, you won't starve if he wants you alive. If he doesn't want you alive, don't try to stay around. Uh, how easy. I mean, is, does not the Bible teach that? I can think of many scriptures that teach that very plainly, and I can't think of any that refute it. It's just not the way things are done. I think in the early church... The ministers were volunteers. They got supported because they deserved to be supported. And the poor were supplied from also the rich people in the church who voluntarily, out of love, not out of compulsion, sold extra stuff that they had and helped the poor. As it turns out, it says in Acts that uh, in chapter, 42, uh, chapter 4, verses 32 through 20, uh, excuse me, I must have that backward. It must be 32 through 35. I have 25. It says that there, there's none of them lacked anything. None of them were poor because they cared about each other. Not because there was a communist or socialist system that it was imposed on them by some higher authoritative person, but because they had the love of Christ in their heart. Remember what John said, if any of you has this world's good and he sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how does the love of God dwell in him? Uh, so anyway, it was a... It was a community of love. It was not a business they were running there. Um, and uh, how was church growth uh, accomplished? As you read the book of Acts, it was accomplished by the preaching of the gospel, a, a rather uncompromising gospel, I would say, which I won't go into right now, but I think sometimes the gospel preached today isn't the same gospel they preached. I'm not going to get into that. There's too many things to talk about there. But the, the apostolic gospel was preached, and it was backed up with, with uh, supernatural uh, confirmation. It says at the end of Mark chapter 16 that the apostles, uh, whenever we're preaching the word and God working with them, confirming the word with signs following. I believe in signs and wonders. I'm not a big, I'm not a chaser of signs and wonders. I don't have lots of signs and wonders in my ministry. In fact, I'm not sure I have any. I don't have a gift of working of miracles. There is such a gift, and the apostles have it, and apparently some others besides them have it, according to 1 Corinthians 12. But I don't think very many people have it. But I do think that where the gospel is preached, if it's preached faithfully, there will be supernatural attestation if it's only in the supernatural conversion of people you never thought would have ever been saved. Or is if it's in the supernatural love in the hearts of the converts toward each other who were Jew and Gentile haters of each other before that, or Arab Jews. I know some Jew and Arab Christians that minister together and so forth. I mean... Uh, blacks and whites in this country. So, supposedly there's systemic racism in this country. 
I, I must live in a fortunate place because I've never encountered it. I know there's racists. That's not the same thing as systemic racism unless it's the government programs that have now favored minorities. I guess, uh, I mean, my wife, she's a retired college professor. She used to be involved in, uh, she was the head of a department and she had to be involved in hiring sometimes. She said, if there are three applicants for a position and one of them was a person of color, they had to give it to them. The whites who were equally qualified or maybe more qualified, uh, it, the policy of the college is you take the person of color. You know, there, that, I guess that is systemic racism of sorts. But um, the point is, it doesn't matter what race people are, or even if they live in a very racist society. If they're Christians, they're not racist. Because you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And your neighbor, there's, you know, could be any color. They're a person. So, anyway, the church growth was accomplished by the loving community. You know, it's interesting in, in Acts chapter 2, which of course describes the very first converts on the day of Pentecost and how their lives were lived. We've been reading passages from that through this whole time. But it says, interestingly, um, it says uh, they were daily praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. Because they were living the way we just described, they had favor with all the people. Why? Because the church wasn't just a group of people who were part of the normal dominant culture and who added uh, Jesus to their life like a postage stamp, who just added a day of worship into their week, and that's the only thing that made them different from everyone else. They were different in every respect. They didn't care about their possessions. They cared about people. They didn't, you know, they didn't seem to be doing a lot to entertain themselves. They were getting together fellowship and learn the ways of God and, and walk in them. And, and uh, I mean, they were, they were people with different priorities. They were countercultural. And that society of the early Christians was a countercultural society that made an impact. People thought, that, you know, that's better. That's better than the culture I'm part of. I'm part of the kingdom of darkness. They're, they call themselves the kingdom of God. I think God's kingdom is, is a better society than the one I'm in. Now that, you know, in other words, there was a visible witness that stood behind the verbal witness of the apostles. It's interesting that you read in Acts chapter 2 uh, and a Acts chapter 4, it talks about how the disciples lived in the way we've been discussing. And then it says, and with great power, the apostles gave testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. A church of 3,000 people only had 12 preachers. Well, and a few others. I mean, mostly it was the apostles. Stephen and Philip were not apostles. But most of the people were not evangelists. In a town that size, you don't need 3,000 evangelists. 12 or 14 that had the power of God and the backup of a Christian community that was stunning to onlookers, you know, that was enough to reach, you know, all the neighborhoods. Uh, I, I sometimes teach for an organization that has more missionaries out on the field than any other group I know of uh, all over the world. And they're... Their vision is to just get as many young people, Christian young people, mobilized out to, you know, to flood the nations. And I think, you know, in that organization, there's some powerfully effective Christian missionaries. But there's also a whole bunch of immature people who just kind of join the organization for adventure and things like that. And, and some of them are kind of carnal. Some of them might not even be saved because you only have to go through a short... Uh, lecture phase and an outreach to, to be a missionary in, those or, in that organization and some of them don't, don't even get saved before they're launched. Most of them do. Most of them are saved but they're immature. I, I sometimes think do I want, if I had the choice, would I choose for us to have a uh, hundred thousand missionaries worldwide Many of them who didn't really know what the real gospel is. Many of them are not called of God. They don't have the power of God. They're just kids who are excited about going overseas and doing something for Jesus. I mean, I'm not saying their motives are bad. But that's not who the early church sent out as missionaries. The first missionaries we read about that were actually sent out by a church were Barnabas and Saul. And later Silas. Now these were not very young 
converts who had a lot of zeal and wanted to put in some time for God before they went off to university education or something. These were the best leaders the church had. They were the, they were the, the most experienced, the most mature, the most anointed, the most obviously called by the Holy Spirit. They sent them out. Now, I'd much rather have, let's say, a few hundred or maybe a, a thousand or so people like the Apostle Paul flooding the nations than 100,000 people who, they're not even sure why they're there. Uh, that's just me, but uh, that's how I see it. I think that that's, that's how the early church was different than us. Now, I just want to real quickly go over this. How did that change? It changed the way things do change when people start getting ideas that aren't part of what Jesus or the apostles said. Now, for example, Ignatius, just in the year 110 or 115 AD, he, he wrote seven letters. He was a martyr. He was being taken from his home church where he was an, uh, a bishop. He was taken to Rome to be fed to the lions. And while he was being transported, he wrote seven letters to seven churches, as it turns out. And in each of them, he was concerned about the unity of the churches, that there was, there was division. His solution, let everyone be supervised by the bishop. Everyone do exactly what the bishop says. Uh, you can't have a baptism without the bishop there. You can't take communion without the bishop there. You can't have a marriage without the bishop. Bishop has to be there to keep everyone in line. Now, how did Paul handle divisions that were in the church? Let's say the Church of Rome. Some were saying they could eat all things. Some were saying, no, we can only eat vegetables. Some were saying we should keep a holy day. Others were saying, no, we should keep all days holy days. Differences of opinion. What did Paul say? Let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. There's a lot of negotiables that churches actually divide over as if they're non-negotiables. And the one, one uh, way to maintain unity is to have people love each other and be humble about their differences. And, and, and forbear one another in love, like Paul often said. Another way is to put one guy in charge and say, everyone submit to me. Everyone just do things my way. I know what's right. Whoever disagrees has got to come into agreement with me. That's what Ignatius suggested. Now, I mean, I can't blame him for, in his final days of living, wanting to fix the problems in the churches, and division in church is a big problem. But the solution to division is love and humility, not put one guy in charge who everyone has to conform to. Uh, and that's, frankly, many modern churches have taken that role. We'll have one guy in charge. He's the CEO. Uh, we've got some other guys, maybe the elders, maybe the deacons who are like the board of directors. And we'll make the decisions, and anyone who doesn't agree with us better find another place to get fellowship. And that's why denominations start. Because somebody's in charge. I mean, there's many megachurch pastors, not all, but many, who uh, will put you out of the church if you seriously disagree with them. And certainly, even small church pastors who are very strongly denominational will say, well, you know, I'm in charge here. You're causing division by having a different point of view. Wait a minute, having a different point of view it does not in itself cause division. Immaturity. And divisiveness causes a division. Churches can have people with different points of view without it being divided. Uh, you know, I've, I've had many Baptist pastors say to me, we don't, we don't allow anyone to speak in tongues in this church because it divides the church into haves and have-nots. Well, there are haves and have-nots in the church, not necessarily with respect to tongues, maybe with that respect too, but... I mean, James said, you have not, because you ask not. There are Christians who don't have what they could. And if they are in a church with somebody who has something they don't have, instead of being jealous or defensive, why not just say, okay, well, God hasn't led me to go that direction at this point. I'm following Jesus, and when he wants me to, I'll go that way too. He can, he can give me that if he wants to. In the meantime, we have to fellowship with the other because we're one family. We don't excommunicate people because we don't see things the same way. I've sometimes mentioned on there a church I went to in Idaho for a while. It was a very wonderful church, the best I've been in at one time. Didn't have a name, didn't have uh, official leadership, didn't have a corporation. 
didn't have any salaries, didn't have a statement of faith. You had to be a Christian, and you had to believe the Bible was the authority. And there were a lot of people there. Some were Calvinists, some were not. Some were charismatic, some were not. Some were uh, Anabaptists, some were not. Uh, some were Reformed, some were dispensational. They, they're all there, but they all were there because they had some things in common. They loved the Lord. They believed the Word of God was the Scriptures, the Word of God. And uh, that's about it. And they were brothers and sisters, and they treated each other like brothers and sisters. Were there arguments over doctrine? Of course, there should be. I mean, not arguments in the sense, of, in, in, not contentions, not strife, but discussion. How is iron going to sharpen iron if people who disagree don't talk to each other? Somebody's wrong. Maybe they're both wrong. If, if two people disagree, somebody's wrong. They're not both right. And how can that be improved if not by fellowshipping and speaking the truth and love to each other? And, and, you know, maybe that guy will bring me over to his way of thinking. Maybe I'll bring him over to my way of thinking. Maybe we'll stay the same, but that doesn't, that's not the end of the world. To his own master he stands or falls. Who am I to judge another man's servant? That's what Paul said. And we can survive it if we're not insecure. If our identity is in being a follower of Christ and not in being a Calvinist or an Arminian or a dispensationalist or reformed or something else like that, that's not our identity. If it is, that's wrong. When Paul said in the Corinth, some were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos. He said, what? Is Christ divided? He told that's that's carnal. He didn't tell him which group was right. Well, he did too, actually, because said, some were saying, I'm of Christ. He says, that's the right group. Because as you weren't baptized in the name of Paul, Paul didn't die for your sins, did he? Well, who did, by the way? Jesus did. So the ones who were saying, I'm of Christ, which is what they all should have said, they were right. Jesus did die for their sins, all of them. They were all baptized in the name of Jesus, not Paul or Cephas. But the point is, what about the church people who saw things Paul's way? And the ones who saw things Peter's way or Apollos' way, how are they supposed to get along? I guess they're supposed to love each other. They're not allowed to divide over differences like that. And Paul didn't even say, come on, you guys, you should all think like me. There was one group saying, I'm of Paul. And he said, why aren't you all of Paul? Because we're all of Christ, and Christ doesn't necessarily have us all at the moment in, in, on the same page. We're growing, but we're not all on the same page, so we're going to see some things differently. What are you going to do about it? Run away from each other so you don't feel uncomfortable, you, you don't feel too insecure? How is the, how's anyone going to learn anything? If you go off and say, okay, you see it that way, I see it that way. You fellowship with people who see it your way. I'll fellowship with people. Like, I'll start a new denomination of people who see it my way. Well, then how's it, we'll, be, we'll, we'll both be living in echo chambers where nothing we could possibly be wrong about is being challenged. I was uh, kind of kicked out of a church, not by the leaders, by some... <laughs> Now, but the leaders actually liked me. The leaders were disappointed that I was kicked out, but I was kicked out by some very bossy high donors in the congregation. They, they pressured the elders, and the elders did not kick me out, but I finally said, I know what's going on, I know the pressure, I'll leave. I mean, it was voluntary. But I loved them, and, and frankly, the elders liked me, but I was, I was kicked out because I had a different doctrine than some of these guys had. They were pretty concerned about it. They were... Frankly, they were dispensational and Calvinist and cessationist. Three areas of difference. That didn't bother me about them, but it bothered them about me. And so, so I had to leave. But the interesting thing is that one of those people came up to my wife and said, why do you guys even come to this church? There's a church down there that sees things your way. Why don't you go there? And, you know, we, we just couldn't even understand that way of thinking. What, we, we need to go to our own echo chamber so you can stay in your echo chamber? Why can't the whole body be what it's supposed to be? Why can't everyone be brothers and sisters when you have Thanksgiving dinner and you have you know, family members over and some are Democrats and some are Republicans? You don't kick any of them out of the family. You discuss it. Well, maybe you do. Or maybe they kick you out. <laughs> but it's not supposed to be that way. People weren't always that uptight. And they weren't that uptight in the early church either. Anyway, those are some of the ways that are obviously different. I had a lot more to say, but I, I frankly have used up my time for this. So I'm going to keep my promise and give you some time for q and had a lot more I could say. But frankly, uh, what I said is uh, in part 
what uh, my series called Some Assembly Required on the website. Uh, this is just a little tiny part of what's in that series. So if you want more, including all the things I would have said if I had another hour to do it, um, you can find those there. If you go to thenarrowpath.com and the series Some Assembly Required. I really think everyone should listen to it, not because it's my series, but because the contents of it I think are badly needed to be heard. Um, so I'm going to stop teaching at that point, and uh, we'll just have Q&A. Steve, do you want to take a little break? Uh, I don't need one, but if they do, they've been sitting a long time too, so if they want to get up, we can we take a break. We have refreshments here, free. Go ahead and, and take a break.